This is Patrick Russell. I am interviewing Norman Gaddis for the first time. This interview is taking place on June 5th at uh, Omaha Beach at the American Cemetery. This interview is being conducted by the Making History Project for a project uh, named War and Peace, Memories from War. Earlier you were telling me about how you got shot down during Vietnam. Can you continue with that story? Yes. <clears throat> I was part of a flight of 12 airplanes attacking the target in the southwest corner of Hanoi. And in the process of reaching the target and starting the bombing and so forth, <clears throat> we began to receive ground fire from anti-aircraft guns and also SA-3 missiles coming up. One of the missiles exploded to the left of my aircraft and some of the debris apparently was sucked into the intake and this caused the engine to explode and after that, the aircraft then was on fire. And the process of the aircraft burning, <clears throat> it was rolling and turning, and it happened that my crewmate, who was in the, in the rear cockpit, rear seat, <clears throat> he ejected while the airplane was still in an upright position. By the time I ejected, the airplane was upside down. I uh, ejected from the airplane. I estimate that I was about 2,000 feet above the ground. And uh, everything seemed to work. All of my chute and, uh, and equipment worked automatically. And as I drifted down, I took my cell phone out and told the rest of the crew that I was OK. And then immediately I put the phone back into its case, and uh, about this time I struck the ground. Unfortunately, I'd landed in the center of an anti-aircraft revetment, and there was about 10 young men with rifles who <clears throat> simply gathered around me, and uh, I didn't have any opportunity to play John Wayne or anything else. I just simply put up my hands and surrendered. Sometime during the ejection, I had a cut on just above my right elbow. And it was bleeding, but not profusely. But one of the men there had a first aid kit, and he took his first aid kit and uh, dressed my arm for me. Uh, what year was this? 1967. May 1967. Over Hanoi? Just west of Hanoi, yes. Uh, <clears throat> after a few moments, when things settled down, the guards took me and we drove to an area where the aircraft crashed. I could smell the fumes from the fuel, hydraulic fluid, and so forth. So I knew that we were in the vicinity of where the airplane crashed. What type of aircraft was it? This was an F-4C Phantom, two engine, two place. And uh, <clears throat> uh, we stayed there for about 30 minutes. And then when they came back, when the, some of the guards came back, they were carrying my pilot's helmet and also they cut his name tag out of his flying suit, and he also had his clipboard that had all of our flight information on it. All of that uh, information was clean. There was not any burns on it. There was not any fuel, anything else. So the, my pilot got out of the airplane. There was no question about whether or not he was in the airplane when it crashed and burned. He was not because he was out of the airplane. Uh, but I never found out what happened to him. It was 32 years later before they dug in that area and they found some remains. And through the DNA process, they 
determined that that was my pilot that was buried there, I guess, in a rice paddy for 32 years. And what was your role in the aircraft? I was the pilot, aircraft commander. And what was your rank in the Air Force? At that point in time, I was a colonel, not supposed to be flying combat missions, but I was. And what were your service dates in the Air Force? I entered uh, the United States <clears throat> uh, Army Air Corps in 1942 and served throughout the war. I was in flying school, so I finished up flying school in 1945, just as the war ended. And at that point in time, I was given two options, one to, rele to be released immediately or to serve until June of night. June the 30th, 1947. So I wanted to go to college and I elected to take an immediate release <clears throat> from the service at that point in time. I entered the University of Tennessee and before I finished the first semester, I was recalled to active duty because the Air Force became a separate service and they were involved in the Berlin Airlift and they needed pilots. And so I was recalled to be a part of the Berlin Airlift. And what role did you have in, in the Berlin Airlift? Uh, I escorted the cargo airplanes from Wiesbaden as far up to Berlin as I, we could with the fuel that we had available to us. We simply flew with them so that the Soviets would know that they, they should not be jeopardizing our airplanes. We had two airplanes, one on each wingtip, and <clears throat> we escorted them up as almost into Berlin. But then we were we were short. We would be short on fuel, so we'd have to return to Wiesbaden, refuel, pick up another airplane. How long did that go on? The Berlin airlift went uh, for a total of about eight months and uh, a tremendous operation, probably one of the most humane missions that the Air Force has performed in a long time. We were <clears throat> actually feeding in the American sector of Berlin. We were actually feeding about two million uh, Germans who otherwise would not have any food. And so it was a great humanitarian airlift and, uh, and really an honor to be a part of something like that. What did you do after that? After that, I just became a regular squadron pilot. And I <clears throat> went up through the ranks as first as a wingman and then as a flight leader, ultimately over a period of time, then reached the point where I became a squadron operations officer. And uh, so it was just a normal progression through that particular, uh, that, that career path. It was, everything was normal. But I served in different places. I <laughs> deployed to Japan in 1952. And I took part in the first jet fighter crossing of the Pacific Ocean. We moved a total of 58 airplanes all the way from Albany, Georgia, to Tokyo in a matter of 12 days. And that was the first mass flight across the Pacific Ocean in a single engine airplane. So I did two combat not they were there were lot, some of the missions were logged as as combat tours, uh, and and they did they fell within the purview of that classification. It was not a falsification. It was the fact that we were flying airplanes within restricted airspace of potential enemies of the United States. So it was, it was actually logged as combat time. And 
did you subsequently go to Korea? Well, no. I was flying the missions out of uh, Hokkaido. And uh, it doesn't take very much uh, <laughs> uh, of a, a memory process. We were, we were trying to get information from the Soviet Union. So I flew into airspace over Vladivostok, Russia. And that was the kind of combat. I did not do bop, drop bombs or fire rockets or guns or anything else. It was simply... Reconnaissance? Reconnaissance. Intelligence. Over Soviet territory? In, within Soviet airspace. Within Soviet airspace, yes. And were you ever approached by Soviet aircraft? Uh, never, never. Was that unusual? It, uh, I, th I think that it was, uh, because the frequency of those flights took place during daylight hours and also at dark, and usually in bad weather. We were being used as decoys to see if the Soviets would scramble airplanes up to intercept us. And if they intercepted us, then there was a special U.S. aircraft flying parallel to the coast of the Soviet Union. They could determine how many airplanes had scrambled, how many airplanes they had available to them. And so that, we, we were the decoys for the intelligence people. So you were kind of like a carrot. Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. Yes. Somewhat like a carry. Now, take me back to the time that you got shot down. What happened after that in, in Vietnam? I was, <clears throat> I was taken into Hanoi after a period of time and interrogated by three intelligence people. <clears throat> I was fairly certain that one of the interrogators was a Chinese. In fact, I was quite sure. How How are you sure about that? The appearance was totally, totally different from a, a Vietnamese. As a matter of fact, had a short burr haircut, which you didn't see. And so his features were more Chinese than than the Vietnamese normally are, and he was a larger man. His frame was much larger. He was heavier than the Vietnamese. The Vietnamese were generally five foot, two inches, two to three inches, maybe weigh 120 pounds. He was quite a bit larger than that, and he was taller than that. And uh, I'm, I'm fairly certain that he was Chinese. Okay. And what happened after that? After I <clears throat> refused to give them any information, I was tortured three times, put into leg irons and, <clears throat> and handcuffs, and the handcuffs had a ratchet to them so they cut the skin around here. The legs <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> began to swell up because of fluid, and uh, <clears throat> I was <clears throat> left in there until I was just about to become unconscious. And I recall going through survival school, and I was told there that if you can avoid going through the process of semi-unconsciousness, that's when you will probably provide information to the enemy. And so try to get yourself out of that situation. So I recall that, and I asked them, all right, if you release me, I will tell you. Well, I didn't tell them. I told them lies. I stopped it. All I wanted to do was to stop the torture. And so I told them some lies. And after a period of time, the Chinese person left. And he was gone for quite some time. Left me with two interrogators. And the <coughs> officer in question came back and told me, we know who you 
are. We know where you come from. So they had information. They knew that I was from Cameron Bay in South Vietnam. And they had plenty of information. And so it was just a matter of trying to lie my way out of that situation without giving any information. Uh, I was tortured first and then released and, and questioned some more put back into the arms, and the second time I lost consciousness. So thank God I didn't have to <clears throat> go through all of the pain of that again. What um, were they asking? They were asking, <clears throat> when will the United States invade North Vietnam? How many troops do you have in South Vietnam? How many airplanes? Uh, what other resources do you have in the Far East that would, could be used in a war? Should the United States elect to, to invade North Vietnam? They were, I think, very much afraid that that would happen. And uh, they had gathered a lot of information. They had copies of Air Force Times. They had copies of, of bulletins from many of the bases in Thailand and in South Vietnam. Um, and they would confront me with that information, you know, do you know this, do you know that? And my response would be, well, I know of him. I don't, I don't really know him, I know of him. And try to pass it off without that. So after the second time around, uh, while I was still uh, still lucid that I could remember things. They put me in the in the hemp in the locks again, and so I went through <coughs> that time and stayed. Uh, I lost consciousness. Uh, when I woke up, I was in a different cell. I was lying on the floor. Uh, my arms were bleeding, legs were bleeding, and. Uh, they brought some food in, left it, but I looked up, I was on the floor, had two concrete beds, I was in the center walkway, and big rats were up there eating the food, so fortunately they ate the food and didn't begin to chew on me. But the, the interrogation itself lasted 64 hours. People will say, well, how do you hours? know that it was 64 hours? Well, <clears throat> to the north of the prison camp, there was an apartment complex. And there was also a church, and the church bell chimed. And I could tell, I reconstructed from the time that I was brought there about midnight on the first night until they finished up, and it was a matter of 64 hours going through this interrogation. But it left me with uh, being unable to eat. Uh, when they brought the food, it would be in a small bowl, <coughs> usually a metal bowl, and uh, I would just have to simply hold it with my wrist and try to eat like a dog would eat. And so uh, I lost a few pounds, <coughs> several, several pounds. When I finally finished all of the interrogation, and shortly after that, I was pulled out and taken to another room for some more questioning. And in the process, I, <clears throat> the guard was ahead of me. I saw a set of scales. I got on the scales, and with my hand, I could move the weights and I weighed 122 pounds. My normal weight was 157. So without eating for a long time, you lose, lose weight rapidly. And of course, being in solitary confinement didn't help things at all, psychologically. How, what happened after the interrogation? After the interrogation, they decided that they apparently had not gotten the information they wanted, and they put me into a cell 
and the cell was seven feet square. It had two concrete beds, and then the center walkway had a bucket that he used as a toilet, had one container, a ceramic container that held probably a half a gallon of water. And they gave us, they did give us boiled water twice a day. But uh, I stayed in that cell for a thousand and four days in solitary confinement. Never saw another American, never talked to another American. I did have an experience there that was just unusual. The young man who portioned out the food for the people in that area, we referred to it as Heartbreak Hotel, a total of seven cells. People were brought in, usually they were severely wounded, and they had some someone trying to look after all of those people. So they fed us twice a day. And <clears throat> one time when I walked out, I was confronted by this young man. He was probably about five foot two. And he said, hello. And I said, where did you learn English? He said, I went through flying school in San Antonio, Texas. He was a South Vietnamese pilot had been captured and brought there. So we, over a period of time, we nicknamed him Max. And Max was our eyes and ears because he provided us with intelligence information about what is going on within the larger campsite, campsite being uh, all of what was Wallow Prison at that time. And they had some between 400 and 500 U.S. prisoners there at that point in time. And when were you finally released? I was released on March the 4th, 1973. And how did that come about? Uh, <clears throat> the Vietnam War, President Nixon in December 1972 finally released the B-52 so they could come north and bomb. And for 11 consecutive nights, they bombed Hanoi, something merciless. And after 11 nights of bombing, then the Vietnamese agreed that they would release the American prisoners. And so after a period of uh, 2,124 days, 2,124 days altogether. I was released from the prison in that Vietnam. And I'm sure you were glad to finally go home. I was, I was ready to go home, yes. I was ready to see my children and my grandchildren. Yes. And um, how did you end your military career? After I came back, I was promoted to Brigadier General, and my job then was the Director of Operations uh, for Tactical Operations for the Air Force. I spent the last two years of my career as a uh, staff officer in the Pentagon. Well, I thank you for taking the time to share your story. Thank you. And I thank you for your service as well. Fine, thank you. It's been nice talking to you today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.